Greetings and salutations, I'm Terran Reviews. Tonight we're going to be experiencing a throwback to a more splendid time, a much simpler time when video games still came as complete packages, unmolested by the modern day cancers that are rife within the industry. Do you suffer from a vitamin D deficiency caused by photosensitivity? Have you ever felt the urge to LARP as a ninja and have a love for the color green? Does talking to people face to face trigger your social anxiety? Are you constantly finding yourself lacking patience and want to remedy this imperfection? Or maybe you just have an obsession with purchasing expensive military headgear. If you have answered yes to any of these questions, then I might have a treatment for what ails you. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, released in 2005 by Ubisoft Montreal, which is located north of the Grand Exchange, deep within the wilderness, and is inhabited by Frenchmen and Anglos. I know, it's terrible, but trust me, this game is worth your time. Probably. Maybe. We play as a splinter cell for Third Echelon, which is a clandestine organization with a modus operandi that basically says if we need to kill, torture, or break the law to complete a mission, then do it. When all means of electronic intrusion have failed, a splinter cell is sent in for the physical approach. Our very existence is a secret, even to our own government. Quite simply, we don't exist, so if we're killed or captured, no one is going to come looking for us. It's all about plausible deniability, and everything is 100% unofficial, and our unclaimed bones will become a free source of calcium to be sold on the black market. Over the course of the game, we will find ourselves smack dab in the middle of geopolitical hotspots and high tension situations, where even a slight screw up has the potential to cause all sorts of turmoil, up to and including World War III. Our job is to gather critical intelligence and, if possible, take out key targets to defuse or outright prevent these proverbial shitstorms. The whole world could be at stake at any moment, so you better not fuck up. So no pressure. What does this mean? It means that stealth is the name of the game for those more sensitive missions. What about when we're dealing with rebels and terrorists that nobody will miss? Well, that's when killing to your heart's content is a viable option, if it strikes your fancy. Whether you decide to go loud or silent, you have a wide range of tools and moves at your disposal. Use your acrobatic nature to pull off wall split jumps, so you can crush your enemies like a watermelon with your dummy thick mass. Or you could just avoid them entirely. Not aggressive enough for you? Well rest assured that first degree murder can be accomplished in many ways. Explosives, underbarrel attachments, guns, the environment, and a knife are available. Stealth involves being conscious of your surroundings. The darker the environment, the better. If you're in complete darkness, enemies won't be able to see you, unless you breach their personal safe space. Chaos Fury is the reason why I sleep with the lights on, because I'm afraid Michael Ironside is going to crawl out from under my bed and give me the London experience. The amount of sound you create is another aspect you must be mindful of. Sometimes the environment will have loud, local audio sources, which allows you to generate noise without alerting everyone within a five mile radius to your presence. It's quite useful for being able to move through areas quicker than your usual arthritic pace. Whether or not you've been discovered is largely dependent on these two aspects and the environment. Stealth isn't just about going into crouch mode and staying out of the arrow's line of sight, which is a case of poorly implemented or half-baked stealth features. It's a great system that doesn't restrict the player and allows the lighting and audio quality to truly shine. If anything, light, shadows, and sound are the true adversaries in this 2005 glowy simulator. Avoiding social interaction wouldn't be complete without the inclusion of gadgets to aid you, which there are plenty of. Can't tell if there are people on the other side of a door? Just use your optical cable to take a peek at the other side. Unable to get past a well-lit area or a camera in a difficult spot? Pull out your pistol with jammer functionality and temporarily disrupt the electronics long enough for you to slip past. This globetrotting adventure will take you to many places that have different environmental obstacles. Got lost in a steamy Japanese bathhouse? Use your thermal vision to flex on the poorly equipped mercenaries. Scared of the dark? Night vision. Need to distinguish electronics from the environment? Switch to the electromagnetic field setting. Sam's tri-goggles are an iconic staple of this series, and I really, really wish I had the kind of disposable income to blow on a pair of NVGs. There are times when you might find bags of flesh in between you and your objective. Fear not, because you can shoot sticky cams to walls, which can then be used to distract and lure guards towards them, only for them to be gassed. It's PewDiePie's favorite gadget. In summary, if you ever feel stuck 
or don't know what to do, just try experimenting. Who knows? The results might just surprise you. On the PC, your movement speed can be fine-tuned by simply moving the mouse wheel up or down. You can go all the way from a snail's pace to a brisk jog in the park, which creates various levels of noise. It's an interesting system that allows the player to have far greater control over their movement as opposed to other games. Enemies aren't the only barrier to entry. Locks and biometric scanners can be dealt with in two ways, brute force or the silent method. If you're patient, you can pick the lock by placing pressure on the key pins. Conversely, if you don't have patience, you can break the lock's latch. This way is quicker, but the enemy will notice the broken lock and be on alert. The same thing can be said for biometric scanners, which if hacked, cause guards to become suspicious, so it might not be a bad idea to get someone to open the door for you. Being the third game in the series, Chaos Fury enjoys a nice selection of high quality designed levels, although there are some sour moments that will spoil the fun. The bank heist is arguably one of the best levels in the game that lets the player tackle their objectives how they see fit. With a killer BGM and various points of entry, it really is the height of Chaos Fury's level design. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the end portion of the bathhouse level, where you're forced into combat, the AI is hyper alert, and to top it all off, you have to disarm bombs while enemies enter a tightly packed space to stop you. Contracting the Crimson Plague is going to be a much more enjoyable experience than this shit. Also, fuck the CL level. Actually, CL isn't that bad. I'm just a madman, venting my frustration with the virtual realm. Despite Chaos Fury being old enough to join the American military, the visual fidelity is surprisingly good for a game from 2005. Considering that the gameplay makes heavy use of light and shadows, I can safely say that these elements still hold up and help to augment the dated graphics. Although some of the facial textures... Oh my god! What's wrong with your face? There's no explaining that. However, your mileage may vary depending on what modern GPU you have. Personally, I never had any issues. I've included a guide in the description for those of you that do have problems. This guide even has 4K AI enhanced pre-rendered cutscenes. Chaos Fury's premise is centered around what a boomer's idea of hacking is. We're on a mission to uncover a conspiracy to start World War 3 and who stole those weaponized algorithms. It turns out it was the leader of the Japanese Internet Self-Defense Force. They're commonly known for spreading misinformation about katanas and the mass creation of anime kuma threads on your favorite Bulgarian rug weaving forum, but I digress. The ISDF and one of your buddies orchestrated the whole thing. Turns out they were the ones who stole those algorithms. They used them to cause a best Korean missile to strike an American warship, which ends up sparking a conflict on the Korean Peninsula that could spiral into World War 3 at any moment. All of this is so Otomo can force Japan to repeal its post-war constitution, push out the American military presence, and reignite its imperial legacy. I'm not even sure where to start with the soundtrack. It's great. Too often I am greeted with forgettable and uninspiring music, but here I can safely say that Chaos Fury's OST does not fall into those categories. Every time you cause a guard to become suspicious, you feel it. Whenever you're sneaking past someone, you become completely immersed and feel as if you've become one with the shadows. Every single track is phenomenal. Unfortunately, tethering your online modes to GameSpy and forgetting that the game even exists means that the end user has to jump through about 10 hoops before they can play with their friends. This shouldn't be surprising to anyone because this is in keeping with Ubisoft's tradition of fucking over their customers. Anyway, co-op. It features a bunch of exclusive story missions where players can use their bodies to climb and traverse obstacles, things that obviously cannot be done in single player. Timing is important, especially cooperation. However, since all my friends are filthy casuals and don't own Chaos Fury, what you're seeing is other people's gameplay. Multiplayer is quite interesting as it features a spies versus mercs mode. Spies and mercs have different playstyles, gadgets, and even different viewing perspectives. Spies have to target objectives while the mercs play defense. If you have the patience and some friends, you might find a decent amount of fun here. Since I'm not on any prescription medication for ADD, which I probably should be, I have very little desire to jump through those hoops to get the online portion of this game to work. However, if you're still interested, I've included some links to videos and a Steam guide about the co-op and multiplayer in the description. Getting Chaos Fury is fairly straightforward. If money is not a problem and spending a few bucks won't break the bank, then I suggest buying the game on Steam, just so you don't have to download Ubisoft's launcher. It usually goes for about 10 freedom bucks for you Americans, or about 9 bing bongs if you're British. If you don't even have enough money to catch a train to Core City, then I'd suggest waiting for a sale. But if you consider that the game hasn't been on sale since 2020, you're probably not going to have much luck there. There's only one course of action left. Don't worry, I won't judge. 
Splinter Cell Chaos Fury is a wonderful stealth experience that not even its own flaws can degrade. It is a nice little throwback to a time when buying a game meant that you got 100% of that game. If a Splinter Cell game was released today, it would have missions ripped out of the main game to be sold as Day 1 DLC, a tedious and time-consuming loot box progression system where we can't simply buy gear, but instead we're sold XP boosters for real-world currency. If that doesn't sound unreasonable, Imagine if chess allowed you to hit a button to allow you to buy in-game currency that could be used to respawn your pieces. And for those free-to-play players, you're only allowed to earn in-game currency for the first three games of the day. If my calculations are correct, it will take about three months to unlock a new chess piece. But hey, at least you can make your king look like a pizza. Truly, the pinnacle of what the gaming medium has to offer. Anyway, I should probably end this video here before I lapse into a stroke due to my elevated cortisol levels. Splinter Cell Chaos Fury. I love it and highly recommend it. Thank you for watching these videos that contribute absolutely nothing beneficial to society. Maria Narcissa. You're not trying to set me up on another blind date, I hope. The Maria Narcissa is invoked. So was the last girl you set me up with. Fisher. Sorry. Thanks, Sam. That's the last one. I can't wait to sniff around and displace his laundry basket. Uh... What? Laundry. I totally forgot. Give me some intelligence or you'll be pushing up daisies in a cemetery full of guys just like you. I don't have any intelligence! Hey, <laughs> you just called yourself stupid. Good work, Sam. That shut down the magnetic locks on the windows. Hey, wait a minute. Power spike. The lobby. It looks like a laser grid just came online. Lasers? Lasers are so... 90s? I was gonna say 70s. Can you please stop making me feel old? Got bad news for you, Sam. You are old. You want to tell me what's going on, Lambert? Sorry, Fisher, but you're getting too old for this kind of work. Stop listening to Grimm. If you go by her definition of old, you'd need to issue diapers with every set of goggles. If I listen to you much longer, you'll be adult undergarments. That was cool. Fisher, those guys don't look Japanese to me. Yeah, expensive suits cut wide in the shoulders. They're packing for sure. Exactly. I make them for displays, trying to keep a low profile. Makes sense. Doug knows how to stay discreet when it's necessary. 